Welcome to part one of the yellow pill. It seems to be the case that reactionaries like to explain their belief with language that takes the form of vaguely gesturing to an argument that is never actually solidly laid out. In this way, it is possible to sound deep and full of meaning without allowing yourself to be nailed down and argued against. A charitable person would label this approach theory. After receiving heavy criticism for our last piece on Yarvin, I have tried my best to drink deeply from the moldy chalice to see what lies at the bottom of the brew. I will try to extract the argument as best as possible from the wandering analogies and innuendos. Thank you so much to everyone who asked for this because I wouldn't have willingly taken this on. However, in return, you must now plod along with us through the works of one Curtis Yarvin, aka Mencius Moldbug, as we determine whether we should be looking back instead of looking forward. We will start off with trying to understand the worldview of Yarvin. He is a decent writer. It is a little stream of consciousness, for sure, but well written enough. I think that an understanding of his angle is important for understanding what he means. During our journey, we will be subjected to many excerpts from Yarvin's writing, edited for brevity but left mostly intact. This can't be helped. To repair a latrine, you have to get a little shit on you. To be a Catholic, you have to have faith, because no one has ever seen the Holy Ghost. To be a progressive, you have to have trust, because you believe that your worldview accurately reflects the real world, as experienced not just by your own small eyes, but by humanity as a whole. But you have not shared humanity's experience. You have only read, heard, and seen a corpus of text, audio, and video compiled from it. And compiled by whom? Which is where the trust comes in. More on this in a little bit. Yarvin starts off by explaining that he was raised as a progressive, and in order to be a progressive, you must have faith in your understanding of the world, which he will go on to try and undermine. It will also become quite clear that he has chosen to view the political spectrum, not from an international viewpoint, which would consider Democrats and Republicans both liberal parties, opposed to progressivism, as we typically use the term. Progressivism is typically defined by its anti-capitalist nature. He instead defines it from the point of view of what he considers himself, a Jacobite. He is able to lump in all Democrats and people to their left as progressives by using the term from the point of view of a 14th century monarch. In this way, Curtis Yarvin completely dodges any and all arguments coming from the anti-capitalist left throughout his work. In the beginning of an open lender to open-minded progressives, Yarvin creates variables and defines them for use throughout the work. He starts, and we will start, with the W Force. Well, just look at the record of social justice movements. If there is a constant phenomenon in the last few hundred years of Western history, it's that, with occasional reversals, reactionaries tend to lose and progressives tend to win. Whether you call them progressives, liberals, radicals, Jacobins, Republicans, or even revolutionaries, socialists, or communists, the left is your winning team. What's interesting about this effect is the number of theories that have been proposed to explain it. Richard Dawkins attributes it to a mysterious force which he calls the Zeitgeist. Dawkins, to his great credit, allows as he has no understanding of the effect. It is just a variable without which his equations won't balance, like Einstein's cosmological constant. Others of a more theological bent have attributed the effect to divine providence. Note that the success of progressivism quite conclusively disproves the providential theory of divine right monarchy. And then of course there is our old friend dialectical materialism. Since all these theories are mutually inconsistent, let's reserve our judgment by calling these mysterious left favoring force the W force. W for Whig. From its introduction, the idea of the W-Force is referring to the successes of social justice. 
As leftists, we know that liberal parties love to hand out victories in the social justice department. Even capitalist corporations will virtue signal to these causes. They do this as a fig leaf and as a method of bifurcating the working class. Half of the working class rejoice in their victory, and the other half denounce the concessions made to the Untermenschen. Meanwhile, no progress is being made on improving the material conditions for the working class, which is the primary goal of progressives. Also notice how Curtis mentions dialectical materialism without addressing it whatsoever. His strategy throughout will be to occasionally mention the most cited and influential philosopher in modern history, or his work, but never address any specific arguments that a Marxist might actually make. Next, Curtis introduces one of the main sources for this particular stripe of conservatism, Hindu spiritualism. It's no coincidence that he chooses to use the term Brahmin to refer to what we would probably know of as the professional managerial class, and he links an Obama video in the blog which seems to be completely irrelevant to the stated reason he added it, namely to explain the term Brahmin, which are elites in a caste society. Instead, the Obama clip seems flippantly added to garner support from racists. And the camera eye hilariously stalks and pounces on all the diversity it can find. But it cannot conceal the horrible truth. Almost everyone inside the Good Ones campaign is white. Maybe one in 15 is black. Maybe one in 20. Definitely not one in 10. And I suspect many of these hold positions for which melatonin is a job requirement, i.e. working with the community. Bell curves being what they are, you need one thing to achieve the Obama team's rarefied whiteness. An ultra-competitive, race-neutral employee filtering process. These people could be the audience at your average Google Tech Talk. Everyone in the room, whatever their skin color, is not just a Brahmin, but a high Brahmin. A status held by anyone obviously smart enough to get a PhD, MD, etc. from a top school. Surely, dear open-minded progressive, one can disagree honestly on whether employment decisions should be made on the basis of skin color. It is, after all, a human ought. Given how unusual the idea of racial preferences for colored people would have sounded to the Americans of, say, 1908, don't you find it a little unusual that there should be so little, um, variation in all of these supposedly independent decisions in human ought space, as produced by our glorious variety of supposedly independent universities? I won't comment on the implication that the group of people around Obama in this video is wider than it should be because the bell curve is correct in its description of black people as intellectually inferior. I will instead talk about the point he is making with regards to universities and their diversity policy. He does what he always does, which is talk around a point without distinctly laying it out, so I will try and do that for him. Because universities are wider than the population is, relatively speaking, their policy is to accept blacks at a higher rate. A university is too white, so it ought to recruit more blacks. Curtis is saying that Hume would object to this. Curtis is also saying that the universities are clearly not independent because they have all made this false is ought connection simultaneously. And shouldn't there be some variance in university policy when it comes to the black question? The only point I think needs to be made about this section is that Hume was just saying that normative claims can only reach normative conclusions. You can't reach factual conclusions from normative claims. Universities are making a normative conclusion from the normative claim that black people shouldn't be discriminated against. This normative claim is backed up by a large amount of research at this point, such as identifying greater differences in IQ between members of a race than between races, Increases in IQ over time among races relative to other races based on their material conditions improving. And a greater understanding of phenotypic expression being basically unrelated to the underlying genetic makeup of human beings, which is virtually identical across all races. No is statement was derived from ought premises in this example. 
Now, would it be expected that different universities could have different normative claims about what is appropriate for their entrance process? Yes, and there are different standards for different universities. I think most universities and most people seem to agree on the normative claim that black people shouldn't be discriminated against. Not least of which because race is a made-up classification used to divide the working class against itself in colonial Virginia, while simultaneously enabling this triangle slave trade to further enrich a bunch of colonial proto-capitalists. We can't stick our hands this deeply into the T-Rex-sized dung heap too many times or we'll never be able to extract it. So from here on out, we will try to be more judicious with our application of critique. Being a Brahmin, he explains, is not a function of money, but of your success. Brahmins are people who work with their minds. Brahmins are the ruling class because they are literally the people who govern. Public policies in the modern democratic system are generally formulated by the Brahmins, typically at the NGOs where these white people like to congregate. And while not every progressive is a Brahmin, and not every Brahmin is a progressive, the equation generally follows. Most important, the Brahmin identity is inextricably bound up with the American university system. If you are a Brahmin, your status is either conferred by academic success or by some quasi-academic achievement like writing a book, saving the earth, etc. Thus, it's unsurprising that most Brahmins are quite intelligent and sophisticated. They have to be. If they can't at least fake it, they're not Brahmins. The natural enemy of the Brahmin is, of course, the Red State American. I used to use another Hindu caste name for this tribe, Asayas, but I think it's more evocative to call them townies. As a progressive, you are probably a Brahmin. You know these people and you don't like them. They are fat. They are exclusively white. They live in the suburbs or worse. They are into oak and crochet in minivans. And of course, they tend to be Republicans. If they went to college at all, they gritted their teeth through the freshman diversity requirement. And their work may be white collar, but it has no real intellectual content. He frames the American two-party system here with this virus X versus virus Y description and claims that the country is ruled by virus Y, namely the progressives. I'm not really sure why the Brahmins would allow the townies to have power for so much of the last century, but maybe we'll find that out in our reading. Next, we move on to some questions that don't have satisfying progressive answers, at least according to Yarvin. He lays them out one at a time. One. What's up with the third world? Here, for example, is a time story on the fight against malaria. And the world changed. Before the 1960s, colonial governments and companies fought malaria because their officials often lived in remote outposts like Nigeria's hill stations and Vietnam's marble mountains. Independent movements led to freedom but also often to civil war, poverty, corrupt government, and the collapse of medical care. Let's focus on that last sentence. Independence movements led to freedom, but also often to civil war, poverty, corrupt government, and the collapse of medical care. What we see here is that independence movements, which the writer clearly believes are a good thing, led to some very concrete and very, very awful results. In addition to this curious abstraction, freedom. Clearly, whatever freedom means in this particular context, it's such a great positive that even when you add it to civil war, poverty, corrupt government, and the collapse of medical care, the result still exceeds zero. Isn't that strange? Might we not be tempted to revisit this particular piece of arithmetic? But we can't, because if we postulate that colonial governments and companies, whatever these were, with their absence of freedom, were somehow preferable to independence movements, which created the same freedom, the words freedom and independence appeared to be synonyms in this context, we are off of the progressive reservation. 
In fact, not only are we off the progressive reservation, we're off the conservative reservation. No one believes this. You will not find anyone on Fox News or Townhall.com or any but the fringiest of fringe publications claiming that colonialism, with its intrinsic absence of freedom and its strange, effective malaria control, note how the writer implies without actually saying that this was only delivered for the selfish purposes of the evil colonial overlords, was in any way superior to post-colonialism with its freedom, its malaria, its civil war, etc. Thus begins Yarvin making the case against independence movements. He does this by cherry-picking quotes like this from corporate Western media sources. When Zimbabwe became an independent country in 1980, it was a focal point for international optimism about Africa's future. Today, Zimbabwe is a basket case of a country. He never questions why these countries go to shit when they move toward independence. He just implies that the independence itself is the cause. While I think there is cause for concern with regards to things like warlordism, the argument that de facto submission to authority is preferred in order to avoid the unpleasantness of a transition to autonomy is outrageous. Imagine Toussaint Louverture listening to this pale amp garter telling him that the transition to independence was a preferred for Haiti, and that he should continue to submit to the French system of the most brutal slavery in the modern world. The average lifespan of an enslaved African in colonial Haiti was seven years. We end part one of an open lender to open-minded progressives with a very clear understanding of what ideology Mencius Moldbug is advocating for. He is a self-described Jacobite and goes on to further describe himself as an absolute monarchist. Thus far, there has been no real argument or reasoning as to why he believes this is the best form of political organization. We have gotten a description of the two-party political system and the revelation that he ascribes to the mysticism of the Hindu tradition, which permeates modern populist conservatism. This is the idea that we are born into a certain caste, and if we are really good at polishing the boots of the Brahmin, when we die, we will come back into a higher caste. This is quite a convenient ideology if you happen to be born into a wealthy family, and it is a new and different way to sell working people on conservative ideas. It is also noteworthy that mysticism dovetails perfectly with free market capitalist ideology. This is no doubt why people like Steve Bannon and Peter Thiel signed on. One way you can draw a political quadrant is to say, um, you can ask two questions, you know, is your country a democracy? And should it be a democracy? 